Paul, before we start, I think I can just, there's a couple of things I was thinking of just in, you know, after the first talk this, this morning, um, sure. you know, just a couple of things that I did want to point out that I should have um, brought out in that, that first talk. And I know we were going a little long on it um, and I apologize for that, but when it comes to identifying some of these new resistant weeds, if they show up on a farm or in an area, um, the one thing that I do want to emphasize is that, again, not only are we interested in tracking where they are in the state, you know, by county or area or township, um, the other thing that we have a very big interest, interest in is actually screening for the resistance of each one of those individual species. So, for example, if you have, you know, resistant mare's tail that you, you suspect on the farm and you find it, you know, certainly reach out to Paul or Dale because what we want to do is we want to collect seeds from those. We get weed seed collections and in 2020 and moving forward, there's going to be more intensive um, herbicide screening trials that are taking place um, in the greenhouse that they'll do. Brian Brown and Lynn um, Sosnowski uh, from the IPM program, they're both going to work on that. Um, so again, that's going to help us identify, you know, exactly you know what sites of action these are these are resistant to and they're doing it now with some mare's tail we've already done brian brown has done some screenings already on tall water hemp populations in the state um, we've identified or brian has identified his his initial screenings on some tall water hemp that we have populations that are resistant to, to the trizines the group fives the group twos um, the group nines which would be glyphosate um, fortunately he's got control of the tall water hemp populations that he screened um, he is getting control of the group 14s or ppo so it's still going to give us that um, nice um, mechanism to come back in and clean those up you know in soybeans for example you know with with a flex star or a um, cobra um, so that's going to help us but again yeah so just remember if you get any of those um, again seed you know weed seed collection is going to be important for us as well um, going forward to identify those Boy, thank, thanks, Mike. That that's a, a great point. Uh, is we uh, we don't know what we've got, what we're all dealing with yet. Uh, so getting on that as soon as we can. That's that's great. Um, yeah, especially with you know. Again, I know that there's not a lot of beans growing in that area, but um, you know, if you had a soybean field and sprayed it, and you had you know mare's tail come through. And it was resistant to both, you know, the group nines and group twos. You know, you could spend a lot of money on a group two herbicide coming back in with like classic or first rate um, would be some of our choices, you know, early um, post emergence. You're not going to catch them, and you know, it's going to be a wasted application and and you know, lack of control. So again, it's it's really important that we identify, you know, is it truly just resistant to glyphosate or do we have multiple resistant, um, you know, mare's tail. Hmm. And, and Mike, I expect this second talk here, Paul? you're going to kind of, yes. This is, this is John Berg, and I have a question for you. You, you. you have a pretty good knowledge of what the commercial applicators around the county are using, plus all the personal pesticide users. Should we be rethinking our program for this year before we take delivery of our products, or should we just stick with what we're already set to thinking of doing for, for weed control? Well, um, I think we've got, um, I, and I'll answer this, and then Mike, you tell me if you think you would uh, you would uh, 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 agree or disagree. I, I think that John, like when the, the program that you and I talked about, I think is significantly different enough with multiple modes of action um, that we would go with it. The only thing I'm thinking is if we're going to do a burn down, like we talked about, um, having seen Mike's slides, I'm thinking maybe we ought to be throwing in some um, 2,4-D or some some dicamba. Uh, so it's not just a straight glyphosate alone, but I think one of the things that I, and Mike, you brought this up last time you, you taught down here, was if you've been using the same program for multiple years in a row, uh, you need to break out of that mold and start to, to change. And I think, John, I think some of the programs that we've worked with you guys on, we are changing the mold and, and moving away from sort of the traditional Lumax, which was a, a stronghold, you know, a, a a, a, a program that we relied heavily on here that the custom applicators relied heavily on it worked um, and it still does um, uh, but primarily that was what was used some some um, Acuron as well so we've you know we've started to get you guys into the, some of the sulfonyl urea herbicide or herbicides and, and it seems to be working well um, uh, so I think 
I think I would just say, I think we're, we're starting to head there, John, already. Um, just maybe want to add to the tank mix of the glyphosate burn down. Yeah, I think, you know, to add to that, Paul, on the burn down, you make a good point about, you know, do we do like a 2,4-D LVE or do we do a sharpen in the, in the program? Mm -hmm. And basically that decision could be, either one of those are going to be good, good um, additional um, sites of action that you could put in with a burn down, whether you're using, um, you know, Gramoxone um, or uh, Roundup, you could use, um, you know, again, 2,4-D LVE. The only challenge that we have with some of these, the 2,4-D LVE is uh, that some people don't like with a burn down is that, again, we have to be mindful of the rate we're using. So if we keep it at, at a half a pound of active or one pint of the 2,4-D LVE, we still have, like in soybeans, we'll have a seven day, you know, so you have to watch that plant back restriction on it. So it's going to be seven day waiting. Um, mm -hmm. If you don't want any waiting, then you just, then then you, then we switch right over to the sharpen and that's where it fits in nicely. We're sharpen um, at an ounce. You can come right back in and plant. There's no restrictions on soybeans. So you don't have that wait time. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing too on, <clears throat> on burn downs, you know, I would, I would steer people away from, from the dicambas for a burn down um, going into soybean and also the 2,4-D amines. Um, because those are going to be a lot longer plant back restrictions for us. So again, look at the 2,4-D LVEs, you know, for the shorter plant back win window or restrictions and or look at possibly, um, you know, sharpen and sharpen worked. And again, not to, to you know, that, that burn down that I was trying to demonstrate with our mare's tail, you know, those applications we made in July, that 32 ounces of Roundup Power Max plus that ounce of sharpen. Sharpen's not a bad program. It did, it did burn it down. Um, it was, it was a problem on us because what we had is we had mare's tail that was beyond the, the labeled rate for sharpen at that stage and the same for 32 ounces of Roundup Power Max. So okay. had we come in there earlier when it was two to three inches tall instead of 10 inches to 12 inches tall that we tried to take down, which we weren't successful doing, again, you know, its timing is so critical with it. Um, and so that was kind of an example of what not to do. Um, the reason that we tried that was is that let's see what would happen. You know, could we raise our, our glyphosate rate and we, and what would happen if we put in that, that one ounce of sharp and would that be enough to take that down in kind of a prevented plant situation? And, you know, we answered it, you know, just in that one, you know, again, it was only one site. We did that um, small plot, but you know, the answer was no, you know, we didn't have the sharpen rate high enough. You know, could we have gone two ounces? We probably should have gone two ounces, but we thought, let's see what happens with just throwing an ounce in with 32 ounces of Roundup Power Max on a burn down, um, you know, on a prevented plant situation. So anyway. And uh, just a quick question, Mike, the uh, plant back restriction for the dicamba products is for the soybeans. If you were burning yeah, down. Yeah, for soybeans, corn, right. You're good for to soybeans. go. Yeah, for corn, you'd be okay. good to go. Okay. Because okay. corn, you're going to have, because really with corn and, and, and it's interesting that, uh, um, you know, you look at some of the work that's done, you um, you know, that Peter Sikama does up in Ontario. Um, you know, years ago, we look back at some of our, and it's kind of interesting as we go back into, to, you know, some of these older chemistries of soybeans that we've, you know, start talking about now, Metribuse, and, you know, we look at, you know, the old, you know, that was the old Sencor. We talk about Cobra now. We haven't seen Cobra used in, in years, right? You know, so we look at some of bringing back some of these older chemistries, you know, so what's, you know, new, you know, old is new again in soybean herbicides now. And then we look at, uh, you know, your question on, on the, the dicamba, but, uh, you know, the work they, you know, that, that Peter's done up in Ontario, especially with water hemp, finds that, uh, um, again, using like a marksman program, you know, the marksman was the atrazine banville premix. Um, you know, that was pretty common program, you know, back 20 years ago. Um, there was a lot of marksman use pre-emergence. You know, that's the dicamba atrazine um, also used mm -hmm. post-emergence. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and they get good good weed control of the um, glyphosate-resistant, uh, you know, water hemp um, post-emergence. And, uh, you know, they were getting good good control pre-emergence in corn, um, you know, with that. So, yeah, good question. Yeah, good stuff. Uh, uh, Mike, you're a great resource. Um, and uh, I think probably a, a good point. If you have other questions, please uh, try to use a chat box. Uh, um, don't be afraid to use a chat box. It's fine to, to chime in as John did. Um, uh, we, don't, we don't want your questions to go unanswered and, and certainly Mike and Joe are great resources here. So uh, Mike, we're gonna turn it over to you to talk about some of the weed control strategies, um, uh, herbicide mixes that we can, um, 
can look at here, maybe uh, in a world where we're, we're also uh, wondering how long we're, you know, what the restrictions on glyphosate may be going into the future. Okay. Um, so thanks, Paul. And what we'll do is we'll start out just a little bit. I know the first slide's going to say no-till. It's not going to be all no-till crop production that we're talking about. Um, but we look at, uh, you know, these, these first, um, this first segment I want to cover is, is, you know, some of the burn downs that we had talked about, um, as well as some of the cover crop burn down issues um, that we have to deal with or address, because I know that, uh, you know, in, in, you know, in, in your area, um, you know, Paul and Dale were saying that uh, the adoption of cover crops is really increasing a lot. Um, you're seeing a lot more cover crops used, and we see that throughout the state, um, cover crops used, whether it's annual ryegrass, um, you know, the cereal grains, um, you know, winter cereal, uh, rye or triticale. Uh, we see a lot of that being used. And in some areas, um, the interseeding, um, you know, with like a Penn State interseeder where they're going in at, uh, at cultivation time and actually seeding the cover crop, um, you know, in season, you know, on corn. And, uh, and we're doing some of that, um, you know, in Northern New York. And I know it's, um, you know, taking off quite a bit in Western New York. And I know Paul said, Paul or Dale mentioned that somebody, you know, in, in the eastern part of the state may have um, a Penn State interseeder. So we're going to see more of that, I think, as we, as we move forward as well, um, you know, as a way to, you know, increase the adoption of this or how do we get these cover crops planted, um, you know, in, you know, for us, even in the north country, I mean, it's it's a short growing season at the end of the season when we get our corn silage harvested. Um, so it's a, our windows are pretty small. And so the interseeder is actually a way to get that crop planted and get it in. So looking at some no-till stuff, uh, you know, we talked about this a little bit earlier. Um, you know, I mentioned that, you know, as we go into no-till, um, we have that increased reliance on post-emergent herbicides using a pre-plant burn down application and post-emergent weed control. Um, also, when we transition um, to no-till crop production, you know, we also get an increased presence of perennial weeds. And, you know, I talked to Dale and Paul yesterday, we had a, you know, phone conversation about that as well of, you know, what are some of the weed species that you guys are seeing in your area? And we look at some of the things as we go to, to no tillage, we're gonna start seeing, you know, more dandelion come into the field. We're gonna start seeing horse nettle. We're gonna see bindweed, we'll see milkweed, um, pokeweed can come in, right? Um, we're also gonna see a shift in some of our annual weed populations. Uh, again, you know, horseweed or mare's tail, right? Um, Again, that's, uh, that's one that doesn't tolerate tillage. So if we had our, in a no-till situation, you know, germinates from a, a shallow soil depth. So we're gonna get mare's tail, wild mustard. You're gonna see some shepherd's purse, lamb's quarter. Our pigweeds, again, um, they don't tolerate the deep tillage as well. And then maybe even Eastern black nightshade. And those are all weeds that I know that we're dealing with, you know, in Northern New York. And I'm sure you guys are dealing with um, similar weed, weed um, shifts or populations in, in your area as well. Um, so again, you know, you know, it just goes back and we're going to hammer this and hammer this and hammer this over and over again, that accurate weed ID is so important. And when I say accurate weed ID, the other thing that, you know, as we talk about, um, you know, trying to identify, you know, is it mare's tail? Mare's tail is a fairly easy one to identify in a field. Um, but when it comes down to our tall water hemp and palmer amaranth, those are a lot more difficult to, uh, um, to identify. And so I, have you know, tell our growers that I work with that, you know, growers and agribusinesses and crop consultants and spray applicators that look, if you've got a weed out there that you don't know what it is, and if you think or suspect that you might have tall water hemp or palmer amaranth, but you don't know, you know, it may be just red root pigweed, it may be green pigweed, you know, you don't know, um, certainly have us come out and look. And I, you know, I tell them that I don't care if I go out and if you think that you have tall water hemp and I go out there and it's velvet leaf, I don't care. I don't get upset that you didn't know it was velvet leaf. Again, it's just knowing that, that we have an accurate weed ID to know what's out there. Um, and that's going to help us with, um, you know, the, um, putting together the proper program. And then also we need to do the proper timing of these herbicide treatments. And, you know, like I said, with some of these weeds that can grow so quickly, you know, it can be, you know, it can go from a two inch weed to a five inch weed pretty quick. And then we're, um, you know, behind the eight ball. Um, scouting fields, again, critically important. Um, effectively dealing with these perennial weeds in no-till situations, that's going to make it tough in a no-till situation if you're going to do um, successful no-till weed control and think you're going to get away with just, a, you know, a one-time pre-emergence application. You know, in many cases with a, a no-till situation, you know, we find some that, that have transitioned right over to a total post, you know, 
and we also are seeing a lot more two pass programs in those in those to control you know our early flush of our our annual weeds and then we're coming back in with a post emergence application to, to to knock down some of our our perennial weeds that are out there um, and again that you know we've talked about these burn down herbicide programs you know if weeds in where the cover crop are there so <clears throat> herbicides and um, rotation of cover crops this is just one slide that i um, you know, want to put in there that, uh, you know, as we start using cover crops, you know, we have a lot of questions about, you know, the interactions of these herbicides with our um, cover crops that we're planting and, you know, can we do it? Is it going to hurt it? You know, are we able to put down, you know, say a, a bicep and prowl program and then come back in in the fall and plant, you know, cereal rye and is it going to grow? Um, so these herbicides, you know, with residual activity can interfere with the establishment and growth of some of our cover crops. And so it's going to depend on a lot of things. It depends on really how, you know, how long does that herbicide persist in the soil? And then how sensitive is that cover crop to the potential herbicide residues? So we have to ask those questions. Um, another one that I do want to point out, um, you know, that, that can get a little bit on the sticky side, you know, when you talk to some growers about it is that, uh, you know, if we're going to use our cover crops to be grazed or harvested for feed or forage, you know, you have two questions you have to ask yourself. You know, if you are going to use um, these cover crops or graze them um, or harvest them for feed or forage, um, then you have to follow the, the rotational or plant back restrictions on the label um, of the herbicides that you're using. And then if you're not going to use them for feed or forage, then it's a little bit easier because, you know, you can plant a cover crop after any of these herbicide programs. You're just assuming the risk of crop failure. Um, so you're going to have a lot more flexibility if the cover crop won't be harvested or grazed. So managing cover crop growth, I mean, so there's some ways that, you know, multiple ways we can manage cover crop growth. Um, one way would be winter kill. Um, so we do have some growers that do use, you know, um, an annual, um, such as like a, a tillage radish. We're starting to see a lot of tillage radish planted, um, especially in, in my area following, um, it's popular following a harvest of winter wheat. Um, sometimes we can get our, our corn off early enough where they'll put in tillage radish and that's all they're putting in is tillage radish and then winter kill takes care of it. We don't have to worry about a green crop in the spring. Um, you know, others have, have gone to oats, uh, planting oats, um, you know, in the fall instead of cereal rye. So they plant oats, they get a cover crop, and then it just kills out itself and you don't have to deal with trying to kill a rye or a triticale or an annual ryegrass in the, in the um, springtime. Um, others would be mechanical to, um, control of, of the cover crop, which would be tillage, mowing, roller crimpers, and then um, last would be herbicides. So here's the big question that we have that, uh, that I'm sure that Paul and Dale um, field quite frequently. Um, I know that, you know, we get that question a lot too, is, is the question is, do we plant green? And planting green would be, do we take a cover crop, a living cover crop like rye or triticale, or annual rye, and do we go in and no-till into that um, when it's still green? And, uh, you know, so that's the question. I'm not sure there's a right or wrong answer to that. Um, I don't recommend it for a number of reasons. And, and again, you know, it's fine if you want to do it, um, but there's a lot of risks that are associated with it. And, you know, for me, I'm just going to, you know, be more on the conservative side and says, look, I don't, I don't want to take those risks of what can happen if I do plant green. Um, you know, the entomologists tell us not to do it. Um, you know, Elson Shields, he'll be the first one to say, okay, go ahead and do it because it gives him, you know, gainful job, you know, security because, you know, we're, we're creating these, these hosts um, for, for insects, you know, such as seed corn maggot, um, you know, army worm coming in, also, um, you know, cutworm. So here's kind of an example of that happened, a real life example that happened just a, um, a few years ago here in the North Country. And, and we had a situation where it was a very wet spring. Um, farm planted the whole farm to uh, winter rye. He was on heavier clay-based soils. And come time to, um, you know, terminate those or, or spray, he was going to spray them, um, have them sprayed with, with an herbicide for burn down. Uh, weather conditions kept him out of the field. Field conditions were too wet. The cereal rye got a little ahead of him. And then they were going to try to take care of it with tillage. And they tried that and field conditions were still not conducive for tillage. And then the cereal rye continued to grow and then it got pretty tough. And then this was the situation he was on, on, on all of his corn acres um, 
were like this, where he actually had to go into a um, cereal rye crop that was, you know, really tall. And you can see by the picture, it was very tall. Had to go in there. It was, uh, you know, certainly less than ideal conditions. But, you know, at the time, he really had no other option at that point to uh, um, to get his corn planted. Um, so waiting, you know, to terminate um, is, is you know, pretty risky in, in my opinion. Um, so in no-till rye cover crop termination, no-till corn and soybeans, uh, glyphosate is going to be the preferred product of choice for the burn down of cereal rye. Um, Cremoxone can be used, but the um, timing is going to be a lot more important with that. Um, so we look at this, and, and I'll just share this trial. This was done at Penn State in Landisville in 2009. Um, it was applied on um, April 13th, and the um, control ratings were on Ju uh, June 3rd. The rye was... Uh, eight to 10 inches tall at time of application. And you can see they used Roundup at 22 ounces and had uh, um, very good control at 98%. They used touchdown total at 24 ounces, had 97%. They used Cremoxone um, Intian at uh, three pints. And you can see it was um, only 70% control of the um, cereal rye, but it was fairly tall, eight to 10 inch tall. And then they used uh, um, Cremoxone Intian plus um, just a, a uh, quart of atrazine with it, and that brought the um, the uh, the control up to 99%. So you can see that, uh, you know, if they, you know, added something more to the tank with the gramoxone, they could improve the uh, the control with that. So um, factors that would, uh, um, you know, for effective um, that they're going to impact the the cover crop control would be the herbicide rate. So the glyphosate rate is going to depend on the stage of growth. Um, Cremoxone, the, uh, we have a new one now. Uh, the newest Cremoxone um, on the market today was uh, Cremoxone SL 3.0 that was just registered in uh, December of 2019, um, replacing the, I believe it was a 2.0 that they had, the SL. Um, so our Cremoxone rate, the high rate for cereal rye would be 2.7 pints per acre, um, and it's going to be better on small rye before the boot stage. And with this, um, air temperature before can, uh, during and after application also influence the control. So, you know, early in the season, we get cool nights, reduces the activity, um, especially when followed by cool days uh, below 55 degrees. Ryegrass cover crop control um, termination. Um, control must be, be before it's eight inches tall. And just a question for uh, Dale or Paul or anybody is, are you guys using annual ryegrass for cover crops in your area? I forgot not, to ask you. Not yesterday. really, mostly okay. cereal rye. Okay, yeah, the same here. We have some growers that um, that are that are using it in the in the North Country, and and not very many are. But when it does, it's um, this can be a booger to control, um, a lot harder to control than uh, than cereal rye uh, than cereal rye does. Um, so if if you are growing it, um, you know, just be careful that uh, we don't let that get too tall. So it has to be under eight inches tall, actively growing. Um, glyphosate's going to be, um, you know, our preferred product in that um, situation, and um, uh, if, for those that heard me talk before we started this um, presentation was uh, Sharpen actually in this case can really improve control on annual ryegrass. And we have a grower that's doing that. They're putting in an ounce of Sharpen with some glyphosate getting really good control. Um, we also want to make sure that, uh, um, you know, we watch the temperature um, with our glyphosate applications. And then the Cremoxone, again, instead of using, um, you know, atrazine, you can use uh, metribuzin. Um, to, uh, and, and metribuzin would be very similar to atrazine. They're both group fives. Um, it's a trizine herbicide. Mike, quick question there yep, that, go ahead. Uh, sure. uh, to, to clarify. The Sharpen mm -hmm. has some burn down activity, correct? Mm -hmm. So we, yep, we Sharpen see... does. Sharpen's got a burn down, and Sharpen has a short residual. Um, it's a group 14 herbicide, and it's found in uh, Verdict, Optil, would be some of the others. So, yes. Yeah. Okay. It does. And it's it's a fast burn down, and you can, um, you know, then that that uh, first slide set that I had where we made the application on July 15th and on July 22nd. I mean, that, that burn down was, you know, it was on glyphosate resistant mare's tail. So that that wasn't any activity from the roundup just in those four days, but it's uh, yeah, it's a very fast burn down. Um, hmm. So, okay. And so here's something on the, on the Cremoxone or Paraquat, just to, um, I don't know, Paul, are you guys seeing much Cremoxone used, are you? Uh, not in Delaware County, but we've okay. got some growers around that have been doing the, you know, planting into the, not necessarily green, but are, they're okay. using Gramoxone to, to sure. kill the rye stand and planting yeah. into the taller stuff. And, and I like the, and I'll, I'll have a couple of 
I'll have another part where I'm going to talk a little bit about how chromoxone really, I like that from the chromoxone and or sharpen for the burn down. Um, and that's nice to have it to make it to, you know, for the quick burn down, the quick knockdown quicker than, than glyphosate. So there's going to be an advantage there. Um, but I did want to bring this um, to, to people's attention um, if they weren't aware of it um, is, you know, as of September of 2018, I don't know how many people are familiar with the new Paraquat label changes. Um, and um, so there's, um, there's been some major changes um, in, in Paraquat and the way we're going to use Paraquat, you know, from here on out. Um, as of 2018, um, restricts are used to certified applicators only. Um, you can't um, um, apply it under the direct supervision like we used to be able to. And um, applicators must also complete an EPA approved Paraquat training every three years. Um, and there's a website for it that's there. And if anyone's interested in it, they can write that down. Or if they're interested in it, I can send them the link or, you know, Paul or Dale have this as well. Um, that's you know a place to direct you for um, for taking that. So if you're going to be an applicator um, applying, you know Paraquat, which would be our Gramoxone, and there's a lot of generics out there as well um, that you have to have this training completed every three years. It's an online thing. It doesn't um, you know it's not too difficult to go through, but you have to have it. You have to have documentation that you've taken it. Um, and it says you know this was from a year ago. Um, it's not required for existing. Um, products where the label does not have the training requirements listed, but uh, I think you're still going to find um, a lot of our newer inventories are going to have that there. Um, the other thing that is changing with Paraquat um, or and or the Chromoxone, and I don't know, I should have looked up the timeline of it, but uh, they're going to, a, um, they're, they're moving to an all closed system, um, closed handling system. And so our um, jugs um, you're going to start seeing Paraquat or Camoxone jugs that you can't take the top off and just dump them into your tank. And it's going to be a closed system so that you can't um, do that. Um, and there's going to be a lot of things with that. You're not going to be able to jar test. You're not going to be able to pour it out into other containers. Um, you know, so they're working on um, those closed system jugs um, and closed system handling um, for, for Paraquat. So that's going to be another change. Um, and also with that is the respirator um, protection on it. Um, so respirators, um, you know, if we're using Chromoxone or Paraquat, you have to understand that we have to use a respirator with it. And, you know, um, some of the changes that everyone on the farm has to comply, there's no exceptions. Um, medical evaluations to wear the respirator, annual fit test, annual training um, for anyone on the farm that's using a respirator. Um, so that has to be done. Um, and those that have gone through this or those that have had like NICAM come out and do respirator training for you, I just, um, I just learned it. Um, I think it was yesterday or the day before uh, the New York State Agribusiness Association had had a, um, had, they've had it, they, they're on ongoing conference calls with the DEC a lot. And, um, you know, in light of the, um, the current pandemic situation we're in right now um, and the pressure that's being put on people for um, respirator fit testing, that they're going to forego the fit test requirements, you know, for the annual fit test um, for the upcoming growing season, as long as you had one in 2019. So you can work on this year's two, or last year's 2019 um, uh, fit test. So again, I'll just pass that on. And if you have any questions about that, the DEC, I believe you should be able to find it on their website or find some information about that if you have questions. Um, so is a pre-plant burn down necessary? Um, so we have to ask ourselves two questions. Do you have weeds in your field right now? And will you till the soil before planting? Um, you know, that's really what it is. Um, you know, it's going to be, uh, you know, if you're going to do uh, conventional, um, any pre-plant plant tillage to control the, you know, the winter annuals such as mare's tail, you know, you're not going to need it. Um, you know, the burn down program with it if you're going to do the tillage. But if you're not doing tillage um, and you have weeds present, um, a burn down is going to be in order. Okay, so essential for a good start, we need to avoid planting into actively growing weeds. I talked about that earlier today. Um, weather, mechanical pro uh, problems, other delay issues um, hinder our burn down efforts. We're going to apply a burn down um, with the early plant um, pre plant program, or we can separate them so we can put a residual with some of these burn downs, which actually, you know, can can eliminate an extra trip across the field instead of sometimes having to go across the field three times. Maybe we can consolidate that, do the pre and the burn down at the same time, and then just come back in with a post. Um, 
and we also have to be mindful that uh, that these resistant weed biotypes, you know, the mare's tail, you know, are spreading slowly through New York State. Um, so a burn down program um, for no-till corn or soybean, we would look at uh, you know glyphosate or chromoxone, Liberty possibly mixed with a 2,4-D um, ester and or sharpen with it. Um, if using the ester, and um, I had mentioned that earlier, um, that you know we have to be mindful that if we're using the 2,4-D ester that we're going to have uh, um, a seven-day pre-plant um, interval that's required for that um, for both corn and soybeans. Um, so if using sharpen, you know, we can use, um, we could omit the 2,4-D ester, put the sharpen in at one ounce, and then there's no plant delays. So that's what we had on, on cover crops, termination of cover crops. And, uh, Mike, and yeah, go ahead, question. Paul. That, that sure. one ounce of sharpen, mm -hmm. rough estimate of what that would cost to add to that program? It's more expensive than the 2,4-D ester, I know that. Um, cost, I don't. No, and I don't know if anyone on the phone would throw a price out. My guess is, boy, if I guessed, I would probably guess wrong. I'm going to say it might be ten dollars. If I had to guess, I don't, I don't exactly know. Um, I used it last year, but I don't remember how much it was. So okay, not to put you, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. No, that's okay. No, I know it's going to be more than the 24D. Um, yeah. So it's going to be the the, the more expensive. Um, but it's you know it's a good program, and it does give you some residual too. Um, it's a good product, does give you some residual, um, you know, using it or, you know, you know, that and the even verdict, you know, the, you know, the sharp and, you know, outlook combination is a, it's a really nice um, program for both, um, you know, soybeans. We used it in the trial, a soybean herbicide trial we've had up here. Um, you know, we've used it in corn before as well. Um, so corn herbicide management strategies, okay, so this is going to be review for many of us. Um, we'll just kind of breeze through this, you know, fairly quickly, then we'll get into kind of the, uh, you know, the, the, you know, dig right down into some of the, you know, the herbicides that we could be looking at or putting together some of these programs. So we could be looking at pre um, programs, pre plus post emergence, our plan two pass, and our total post. And I think right now in, in many areas, um, as, we, as we begin to deal with, you know, again, resistant mare's tail, you know, or the water hemp and, and um, Palmer amaranth, it's going to be, you know, that's going to be the one. It's going to be a pre plus a post emergent application that we're using. Um, so a plan two pass. Um, obviously not ideal for most because it's, you know, added cost um, and it's a lot more, you know, difficult to do, especially if you're making the applications um, yourself on the farm. Um, you know, it really conflicts with a lot of other things that we need to be doing on the farm um, besides just spending your days on, on the sprayer. But uh, again, to, you know, to manage the weeds, that's that's going to be, uh, you know, a you know, critical part of it, a component. And then we have the total post um, corn programs. So where does a pre-program fit? So again, low to moderate annual grass populations is one where I think that that would be a nice place to put them. Um, and basically the, the annual broadleaf weeds are, you know, fairly easy to control um, with most of our um, total pre-programs. Pre um, so where I wouldn't use it would be, um, you know, a high grass population. And I know yesterday, Dale and Paul and I had a discussion about fall panicum. And fall panicum can be one of those challenging weeds that, uh, you know, a pre can keep it under control some, but there is a chance that it can break through at the end of the season. And, you know, we have some cases in, you know, in the North Country where we have some growers dealing with fall panicum that it's actually, it's um, maybe not a yield, um, you know, doesn't impact yield, but it certainly hinders um, harvest um, to the point where it's difficult to get the combine through um, in, in places. Um, and, you know, if we have, uh, you know, maybe ragweed or velvet leaf, maybe another one, if we're going to look at a free program that would be a little, you know, if something's going to go through it, it might be ragweed or velvet leaf, but um, perennial weeds, perennial weeds, and I'd mentioned that earlier in a no-till situation, um, perennial weeds are going to be a problem and you're not going to control them with just a single pass pre. Um, you know, so the advantages with these pre programs, there's a lot of advantages. And the, the main one is, is, you know, I'll tell you, one pass gets the job done early, you know, especially before hay harvest. Um, that's, that's a key part, you know, get it, we're going to get our corn planted early. We're going to get out there. We're going to get our, um, you know, our crops sprayed and, you know, then we're going to move into hay harvest. Um, you know, with adequate rainfall, it provides good weed control for, you know, six weeks. Uh, later emerging weeds have little impact on the corn yield, but we have to watch those later emerging weeds to make sure they're not putting out a lot of seeds, you know, you know, if it was water hemp or amaranth, okay. 
um, and they're effective on many of our annual broadleaf weeds. Disadvantage would be, um, you know, here's our, our big disadvantage is, um, you know, and how many times have we seen that? Boy, I spent a lot of money on this breed program and this is, you know, the Cadillac program. I put it out and we didn't get rain for a week or 10 days and then the weeds came through and then I was coming back in with a total post program or, a, you know, another post program to clean that up. Um, you know, so it does depend on adequate rainfall um, in a narrow period of time. But, you know, in most, in most years, um, you know, we, yeah, it does happen. I'm not going to say it doesn't happen that, that we do get those dry spells, um, but in most cases, um, we usually get a lot of rain, um, you know, in the springtime during um, during application time. So yeah, once in a while we do get that, but it's not all the time. Uh, more times than not, we're going to get adequate rainfall to activate those those chemicals. Um, in some cases, depending on the program we use, we can't overcome that with a pre-plant incorporate, and if it's allowed by the label. I think I showed this photo when I was down there, you know, a few years ago, and this is, uh, you know, kind of a poor job that I did on the home farm is I thought, well, you know, we were, you know, it was one of those dry seasons and I thought, well, we're going to go through, I'll do a pre-emergent herbicide program and I'll just go back and I'll do some pre-plant incorporates. So I just went over it, you know, once with a, um, with a spring tooth and I didn't do a good job at the pre-plant incorporation, but you can see actually in between those rows, you can see, um, kind of the job that it started to do where I mixed in the herbicide a little bit, but I didn't mix it in good enough. And I have, looks like I planted weed seeds in between there, in between the corn. But again, that's uh, what happens. I mean, I, you know, ideally I should have gone over it twice, um, but I didn't, that was just a one pass, um, you know, tried to help out. Um, pre and post, um, this is a the two pass. It's gonna fit, uh, you know, moderate to high annual grass populations and perennial weed situations. Um, it's very consistent as long as we get rain on the pre, um, creates a wider window for the post application. And that's the nice thing that we like with the, with a plan two pass as well, is that uh, we get that pre down and we're not asking that pre to give us full season weed control. We're just saying, look, let's protect our yield early. You know, we want to take that competition out of that, you know, open up that, um, you know, the, the opportunity for the crop to grow during that critical weed free period. Um, it's going to create that wider window, um, you know, that allows us to come in with a post application um, because if we're just relying on a total post program, you know, a total post, I mean, you're out there and you're like, okay, when do you pull the trigger? When do I go out there? You know, boy, I got to keep waiting. I, you know, not all the weeds are up. So I want to wait. And, and, you know, the longer you wait to, for all the weeds to come up in a total post program, you know, the more you're, you're, you're hurting your yield up front. Um, so a total post program is, um, this is a quote from Aaron Hager from University of Illinois, a total post program is the most risky weed control system because the timing of a post herbicide application is almost completely up to mother nature and no one can control the weather. And there's a lot to be said for that because if we're into a total post program and, you know, we have weeds that are approaching that, you know, that outside of that four or five inches tall, okay, I'm going to pull the trigger and, and make that total post application, but boy, now I got a week of you know, rain coming up and I can't get in there or the field conditions aren't right because they're too wet or, you know, I lose some, some spray days because it's too windy. So all of a sudden I'm going from, you know, weeds that were on that upper end of that four or five inches. Now I'm coming in there and trying to make that application and no, I can't get in there today. I can't get in there tomorrow. And then the next thing you know, you're pushed out and every day, you know, you're losing yield every single day. Um, so you can see here's some situations, uh, you know, on the left, obviously they didn't make any application because they couldn't get into the field. And that was a disaster. That was a write off. And then, you know, on the right, you can see that, yeah, okay. They did make the total post um, application, but you could see by the size of the weeds in between the row, um, you just have to ask yourself as to, you know, really, you know, how much damage was done to that, um, the yield potential of that corn, because, um, you know, yeah, you did control it. But, you know, I would say that there was a lot of um, competition early on and it really hurt the, you know, the overall yield potential of that field. So a total uh, post with a residual. And I think that that's what we need to be looking at if we're going to do a total post application um, by putting a residual. And then there's, you know, some reasons for it. Um, you know, we can get, um, you know, you can go in a little earlier um, with a total post, knowing that you're going to burn down everything that's there. And then you're going to give yourself some, some residual herbicide activity to carry you through the season. So you don't have to, um, you know, worry that you made the application too early and then have weeds come in later. Um, 
And, you know, the disadvantage would be, um, you know, if we, if we come in there with a total post with a residual, sometimes we're in there a little early for our perennial weeds that may come in later. And if you're using a uh, residual with it, again, it's a pre, so we need the rainfall to activate it. And again, we're going to be in there at that, um, you know, two to four inch weeds, um, you know, to avoid yield loss. And that's that critical weed free period that we talk about. Um, so here's, a, here's something, and this is where I'm going to go off a little bit on a little, this is going to be a little out there, okay, and I just want to, you know, I'll direct everybody's attention to uh, to some research that's been done by um, Dr. Clarence Swanton at the University of Guelph, and this is just fascinating stuff in the weed science side of it, um, and, and the weed control, um, and so the timing of, um, you know, this is a slide from, from Clarence Swanton, and it's uh, the number one very um, variable driving um, crop yield loss is timing of weed emergence relative to the crop is the fundamental driver of yield loss. And so the earliest emerging, earliest emerging weeds are the most competitive. And so we have to ask ourselves why that question is. And so we always, you know, we've always said that, um, you know, why do we have to go and control weeds in a field? And, and we always have said, you know, if you ask anybody, you know, why do we compete, um, you know, why do we control weeds? And it's well, because weeds compete with the crops for water, sunlight, and nutrients. And some of the research that, that Dr. Swan's done is really eye-opening and really changes the way we look at weed control. And I'll show you another example. And so we had, um, I've had the opportunity to hear his talk, um, you know, him talk um, at conferences several times. Um, we invited him to the, uh, to the North Country at our crop congresses a year ago. And he gave um, talks there. And I know this past year in, in uh, January, he was in Western New York at, uh, the corn congresses in in, uh, in the western part of the state. If anyone ever saw, you know, if anyone you know from that's on today saw his talks, um, they'll they'll understand this. But if you haven't, um, again, it's something really worth looking into. And so, you know, here's a slide that he shows, and he asks a question, and it really you know makes you think a little bit more about this. And, and you know, Dr. Swanton's work that he does, and this is where where it sounds like it's a little bit out there. And, and he really talks about plant communication and weed weed interference um, and basically um, you know he has he's done lots and lots of research for many many years um, to explain um, you know why early season weed control is so important looking at um, the critical weed free period you know that we talk about and you know his work shows that prior um, to emergence um, the crop seedlings can detect above ground weeds and so this is really where it gets out there. So if you look at this field, so he shows this slide at any of his talks, he'll show this slide and he'll, he'll, he'll ask you, he'll, he'll say, okay, you know, we say that weeds compete, you know, with crops for water, sunlight, and nutrients. So if you look at this field and Paul, are you still on, are you? Yeah. Okay. So if you look at that, I just got to ask you a couple of questions, not to put you on the spot or anything, okay? <laughs> but but if you look at this field, okay, and he'll ask you and say, you know, we say that 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 weeds, early season weed competition competes for, for um, you know, water, sunlight, and nutrients. If you look at this growing corn crop right now, do you think it's suffering from sunlight, you know, competition from the weeds? Yeah, you look at it and say, well, the corn's above the weeds at this right. point, probably not yeah. suffering sunlight, but but it looks right. like it could be an impending disaster, right? Yeah, but it looks like right now, I mean, this would be the time that we know, we've been saying for years that this is what's, this is the yield robber of corn right now, right? So this is where we want to be in to get those weeds out of there now. We know that this is, is, is hurting our yield, but probably sunlight's not the issue. What about nutrients? Do you think that those weeds right now are competing with that corn for nutrients right now. Uh, you, you look at it and say, well, they're probably not taking a big bite, but, but you think, right. you know, if we don't get them now, yep. um, it's, sure. it's going to be a problem, right? Sure. Yeah. But we're so thinking that's... that those are like, what, two, two to four inch weeds, maybe yeah. the best? Yeah, probably, yeah, probably so a couple inch tall weeds. Great stage to get it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a perfect stage to get it. So he also says that, look, you look at that cornfield. So now sunlight's not an issue because the corn's above it. Corn is intercepting the light before it even gets to the weeds. Nutrients, he said, boy, he says a lot of these growers, he says most corn growers are putting fertilizer down in that band. So there's a lot of fertilizer and a lot of nutrients available for that corn crop right now. So it shouldn't be compete. Those weeds next to it shouldn't be competing for nutrients. And 
he said, does it really look like it's suffering from moisture there? You know, he says a lot of times our, you know, our planted corn in the, in the season, we're not, you know, we have an abundant soil moisture in the Northeast, right? So it's sure. kind of interesting to say that, you know, why do we have to control these early weeds? And this is really where it goes. And he takes it on, you know, takes it above and beyond further where, um, you know, his work shows that, that actually plants, you know, do have communication. Okay. And they do, they do talk. So this is where you're thinking I'm really crazy. So you can, you guys can get off the line right now, right. Or just mute it. Cause Hunter has gone off the deep end when he starts talking about this, <laughs> but it's really amazing what, what he talks about. And, and what I can do is I can direct everybody afterwards and I can send, if anyone's interested, there's about a, seven minute YouTube video of, of some of his talk about some of the work that he's done. And again, just amazing stuff um, to hear, um, you know, the, the work that, that, that they've done. And it really just goes to show that, you know, any of the work he's done and, and it shows you when you listen to his talk at the end, you're thinking, I'll never do to total post-emergence again. I won't plant green. I won't, you know, I'm going to kill everything first. And again, you know, some of his work even shows that, uh, and again, when I mentioned about the burn down of why, you know, the gramoxone sharpen is nice because it burns it down pretty quickly. You know, he even talks about, um, you know, if you plant green, you know, that's, that's bad because when you plant green, you know, before that corn plant or just as that corn plant starts to emerge, it already senses the weed competition. It's already stressed that corn based on just knowing that there's weeds going to be around it um, because of that. And it and it's all goes back to, to light reflectance. A lot of his work that he talks about and does and so he wants to, if he's going to plant into anything, it's going to be planted into a brown. He doesn't even want to plant, plant it into a dying crop. He wants to plant it into a dead crop where it's brown material. And that's where the chromoxone or the sharpen really is nice because if you're going to do a, you know, burn down within a few days, it's going to be nice and brown that you can plant into. So again, just amazing stuff that he does. And I'll, I'll just go off of that, um, you know, but again, you know, I would certainly um, encourage you to look up some of his work um, that he's done. And, and, you know, if you ever get an opportunity to hear his talks, um, certainly worth the time to go listen to it. Because um, it is it is really, really interesting stuff that he's done. So, Paul, do you think I've lost it now, do you? No, actually, Mike, I think I mean, I've had some conversations with some of my growers and this light interference thing and the wavelengths, mm -hmm. uh, pe people are talking mm -hmm. about that as, as being real. Yep. And, mm -hmm. um, and so I, I think that, um, I think, I don't think it's that far out there, Mike. Yeah. And, and I'll tell you the, the one video that I could send and, and he showed it in his, his talks too, that, that, um, you know, for the first time in his lab that he, he was able to show that they actually took, this was really, this is really how crazy it gets. He took a tobacco plant and he planted it in a, in a pot. And the tobacco plant was independent growing system in a pot of its own where it had its, all the nutrients it wanted, all the water it wanted, independent, um, you know, soil. And around it, they planted um, rye grass around it, like rye, in, into a totally separate thing. So there was no contact, no physical hmm. contact for, for nutrients, for sunlight, or for, um, for, for, for physical contact. And he actually showed that, that, it was able to overcome this, this, the stresses were able to overcome that tobacco plant and kill it without any physical contact. It was, it's just mind boggling when you see what, see what they were able to do. And then they took it to the field and did the same work in the field. It was, it was just wow. amazing stuff. So it's, it's neat stuff. So again, wow. just all it shows. And, and this is some of his work that he actually does. You know, we talk about that critical weed free period, but if you, if you Google that, a lot of the work comes back from Swanton's lab out of the University of Guelph talking about that critical weed-free period in corn. So when we do it, you know, even if we're not going to buy into all the stuff that, that I just mentioned, you know, this is what we need to do. If we're going to have, you know, that critical weed-free period, we want to make sure that we're looking at, at no weeds between corn when it's, you know, in corn between the three-leaf and eight-leaf corn. So V3, V8, right? So we want, that's our critical weed-free period. So Again, any of those weeds that first start to come up, if they do make it, make sure that by sheepers, when you get up to V3, you know, to V8, that's when you have to have it totally cleaned out. Um, because, you know, the work that he showed in, in his trials were at three to four inch tall weeds at V3 to V4 growth stage of corn. This is on the high end, losing about three bushels to the acre. Some of his work was a little bit lower at about a half a bushel per acre per day that you delay the application. If you were up on that three bushel average, you know, ballpark and at 11 bucks a day, you're losing, um, you know, for every day that you delay that. And if you think about it, three to four inch tall weeds and V3 to V4 
um, corn, pretty small corn, fairly short corn, or, you know, and fairly short weeds, three to four inch tall. You know, how many times you go around and see the neighbor that, you know, has corn that's a lot taller than V3 or V4 and weeds a lot taller than three or four inches. And every day you go by their farm, you know, and it's just the neighbor. It's not your own farm because you've already controlled your weeds. It's your neighbor that does it. So, you know, they're the ones that are losing, you know, that much bushel potential per acre um, for every day that they delay. So interesting stuff there. So putting together a resilient corn weed program, again, proper weed ID um, is going to be required. Um, we want to start clean. Um, you know, we want to start clean with tillage, burn down, you know, use um, residuals, multiple S, um, sites of action, right rate, um, pay attention to timing, scout, scout, scout. Um, I'm going to try to get us back on time because I just get so just off track on some of this early stuff here. Um, so getting to know the premixes, we want to know our premixes. Um, again, it's, you know, goes beyond just the premix to know what it's in it. Um, for example, Lumax EZ, you know, we know it's got Callisto Dual 2 Magnum and Atrazine in there, but, you know, we're going to take it farther and say that we need to know that Callisto is a group 27, the Dual is a group 15, and Atrazine is a group 5. So we want to make sure that, that you know, in these premixes, we know the active ingredient, we need to know the trade names, and we also need to know these group numbers. Um, so if we're going to design a total pre-program, we're going to look at atrazine and adjust the rates based on the, you know, the next crop that we're going to plant. Likely, we're going to um, include one of the acetamides, and that would be, you know, the esmetolachlor, the metolachlor, acetochlor, or, or um, the outlook. So we're going to have duels, we're going to have the warrants, the harness, and then we're going to have the outlook. And then we're going to have to look at something to control the trizine resistant lambs quarter in most cases. Um, so by doing that, we're going to look at some pre-programs and I'll go through some of these pretty quickly. And I, then again, if there's any questions, um, I'd be more than happy to email anybody this slide deck um, that, that wants it for reference. Um, you know, I have no problem with that at all. Just reach out to Paul or Dale or myself and I'll get you that slide deck. Um, so again, an atrazine acetamide premix that we use, these are some of the old standbys, the Bicep Light 2 Magnum, Cinch ATZ Light, you know, maybe Harness Extra, Keystone LA or Degree Extra, Full Time NXT, um, Outlook Atrazine. And then we're gonna look at something for the trizine resistant weeds, and that might be, you know, the pentamethylene, which would be our Prowl or our Prowl, you know, the 3.3 or the H2O, possibly Python, but we don't really like the Python, you know, as our choice and the same with Hornet um, as well you know, in corn, I mean, Python would be a, you know, much better used in soybeans than corn. Um, possible though, if you want to get away from like a prowl in that situation. And then if you have uh, crabgrass or fall panicum, you could be looking at some prints up with it. Um, and then we also look, these are some of the, the newer ones are HPB, HPPD inhibitors. Um, I say new, I mean, they were around in, you know, the late nineties, early 2000, right? We started using, um, or HPPDs, but um, these would be some of our newer um, pre's that we're using, and that would be Lumex EZ, Lexar, um, the Acurons, um, Instigate, and Instigate is kind of on its way out. I think they're, you know, some growers can correct me, or agribusiness people, if they're on, they can correct me if they're wrong, but I think some of our growers are saying that the that's going to be phased out, the Instigate, which is, uh, you know, the Rimsoff, Iran, Callisto mix. Um, and then another um, possibility might be, um, you know, the Harness Max, which is Harness and Callisto. Um, mix that with some atrazine. And these would be in, they're also in the 2020 um, Cornell um, Guide to Integrated Field Crop Management. Um, so that's been updated as well. The herbicide um, for corn, soybeans, and small grains have been updated there. Um, so those would be found in the, in the guide as well. Um, so another, um, total pre-program to consider would be the acetamide HPPD growth regulator, which would be our Resicor. Um, in, that doesn't have atrazine in that premix, but we would add that for additional broadleaf um, or grass control. Um, another um, program to consider maybe would be Caprino. Um, if you're gonna do Caprino pre, um, it's gonna be mostly a post program. We're gonna use Caprino, but you can use it as a pre situation. And we've had some growers do it and they get uh, um, they've had some pretty good success with it, um, using atrazine with it, um, but also including uh, dual two magnum for uh, um, improved residual annual grass control and especially not sedge two that we're dealing with. Um, another one would be, you know, just an atrazine prowl program, atrazine and prowl H2O or prowl 3.3. Um, you know, it's not gonna give us any nut sedge control. It's gonna be weak on common ragweed. Um, 
And if you want to improve the broadleaf control um, and or common ragweed control, you can put Sharpen in that mix um, or Verdict. And Verdict is the Sharpen Outlook mix, and that's going to give us improved broadleaf and annual grass control um, plus some suppression of um, yellow nut sedge. Um, so designing a total post program for conventional corn, um, you know, if we're looking at conventional corn, most of them are going to start with an ALS or an HPPD inhibitor. Um, we're going to add atrazine whenever you can. Um, only apply to corn up to 12 inches tall. That's going to be our cutoff for atrazine. Um, it's going to be likely a reduced rate of a pre-program for residual weed control. So we want to make sure that in a total post, it's nice to have, you know, a reduced rate of, of a residual weed control program in there. Um, if we're dealing with nut sedge, um, we're going to be looking at uh, maybe just permit or, you know, most likely Yukon. And Yukon is probably the better fit than just permit only because Yukon is a dicamba um, Halsofuron premix. Permit's just Halsofuron. So permit's a group two. Yukon's a group two plus a group four. So it's going to add another site of action there. So it's nice to have that, that extra site of action in that tank mix. So I think that's where the Yukon has the edge over just permit now. Um, and for those that are using just Roundup and Permit, you know, maybe we look at moving those growers over to Roundup and Yukon because now we've got, you know, the group nines with Roundup, we have the group two, and now we're throwing in a group four because remember, if we have just the group nine and Permit, that's a group two and a group nine, and we have some concerns with some of these group two, group nine resistant weeds coming in, right? Um, and again, that Yukon, you know, it brings that dicamba for improved annual and perennial broadleaf weed control if it's out there. Um, so total post programs, another one that to look at, these are going into our HPPDs. Um, this would be our impact or Armazon plus atrazine. Um, we can add Resolve Q for better control of fall panicum um, that I know you guys are dealing with or some growers are. Um, you can mix half rate of several of the pre-programs. Again, with that, you can add Yukon or Permit for nut sedge control. Armazon Pro is a, uh, one of the newer ones. Um, that's a premix of, of Outlook plus Armazon. Um, you can add atrazine to that mix. And again, if you have nut sedge, the Yukon or Permit can be added with that. Emerged um, annual grass and annual broadleaf weed control. Again, another program would be Acuron Flexi, um, which is Acuron without the atrazine. Um, and then you can add Acuron Flexi plus Atrazine. Um, it's, if you have Foxtail or Fall Panicum, we're going to add, uh, it's not going to be good on, on, you know, per se on the grasses um, if we're using that because the Acuron Flexi has uh, Mesotrione. Uh, Mesotrione is not going to be good on Foxtail or Fall Panicum. So that's where the um, Accent Q or Resolve Q or the Steadfast Q because all three of those are going to give you control of, you know, Foxtail or Fall Panicum. And they're all similar chemistries, right, Mike? Yeah, they are. Yeah, they would be. Yep. So we've got okay. Steadfast Q would be the Resolve plus Accent, and then you've got Accent, which is a nickel, nickel sulfuron. So yeah, they would be. Um, and so yeah, and that's the, that's a good question that we have too, because we look at these, you know, these HPPD inhibitors, and you know, they they really vary widely on number of things: the application timing, use use rate, and selectivity. Um, you know, so some of them are good on. Um, most of them, all of them are going to be good on broadleaf. Post-emergence, they're going to be good on broadleaf, but they're not all equal in their annual grass control. You know, so we look at Callisto or the Mesotrione, you know, not going to be as good on our annual grasses is say like the Lotus would be um, or, um, or the uh, um, Impact or the Armazon or a newer one, which is uh, Shield X, which is another new one that got registered last year. And, and just for the growers on, mm -hmm. on the line, um, that uh, Q suffix there mm -hmm. at the end of those, that, that uh, refers to the fact that's a safe inversion. Yeah. Um, so it's a little a uh, little less uh, aggressive on the corn plant, mm -hmm. correct? Sure. Yep. And what, yep. what would be the height restriction on the corn that you could apply that product up to? The height would be, well, with atrazine, if you're going to use atrazine, right. it's 12. But 12 taking inches. that out, taking that out, I think the steadfast Q accent, you're still going to be in that um, probably 20 on those 20 okay. 20 on steadfast i think it would be so yeah and then accent would be a little bit more then you then you'd be in the drop nozzles um acuron flexi that's going to give you some fairly good height um you could go because that would be the um the bicyclopyrone as a trio and dual and we can go on pretty tall corn with those as well um so then we go into lotus and atrazine um 
again, that's, uh, uh, you know, one, another one of our HPPDs, um, you know, good on really good annual grass control, um, good broadleaf spectrum. Um, again, not, you know, none of these are going to be good. Uh, none of the HPPDs are good on, on nut sedge. So anytime we're using those as our post-emergent program, we're going to be including Yukon or Permit with that. Um, Diflex Duo, which is Diflex, which is a group four, that's a uh, um, similar to a Dicamba product that they have. Um, it's Dicamba and Lotus uh, mixed is Diflex Duo. Um, and then you've got Caprino Atrazine. Um, and that's a, that's a nice um, total post program to consider too. Um, you know, but then um, the Diflex or another di Dicamba product would be nice to have in, in with that because again, it's going to give you another chemistry. Caprino actually has, it's a premix of two. So it's going to be a group two and a group 27. You have Atrazine, which is a group five. And then if you were to bring Diflex to the table, you're throwing in another site of action, a group four, that's going to help you on some of those additional broadleaf weeds there. Um, and here's the, the last of the HPPDs, and that's the newest one that we have. It's Shield X uh, 400SC, um, and that's one that was registered uh, last year. We got a label in New York State, and uh, we use some of that here in the North Country. I was able to, um, you know, get some of the product and use it, um, you know, last spring, and it uh, it really did a good job on um, post-emergence on on corn, in corn, on annual grasses, and in our broadleaf. Uh, you know, broadleaf weeds. Um, fall panicum? No, it's not going to be good on fall panicum, and you'd have to add Resolve Q for better control of fall panicum because it fall panicum because it would have have. Um, I don't even think the label has fall panicum on it for Shield X. It would be very poor control um, if that's the the annual grass that you're going after. Um, so again, there's another possible. Um, you know, possible HPPD to throw in there. You know, so that's going to be very similar to the Lotus to the impact. And then now we have Shield X there. Um, again, it's going to give you good grass and broadleaf control. Um, and then moving into our, our you know, away from the, the HPPDs, we've got the Steadfast Q plus Banville. Um, you know, we can add Atrazine. So the Atrazine, um, Steadfast Q and Banville, that's a standby total post program that Russ Hahn, you know, had suggested for many years. Um, still, still very effective total post. Um, and then Roundup Ready. So I'm going to finish it up with our Roundup Ready crops. Um, Roundup Ready, um, simplified weed control, one product, a wide range of broadleaf um, and grass weeds, no residual carryover. Um, you know, it's done, you know, done a good job for us, provided many, many years of excellent weed control. Um, but, you know, as I mentioned, we have to start thinking about this resistance management. We got to start thinking about, you know, above and beyond just glyphosate. So again, I wouldn't do just glyphosate. So here's some suggestions in corn. If I'm doing glyphosate resistant corn, I might be looking at, at mixing, um, you know, a 50% labeled rate of a certain, of, of any of the pre, you know, many of our pre programs that we can consider. Um, glyphosate plus Acuron Flexi at a reduced rate, Harness Max at a reduced rate with glyphosate, and Resicor at a reduced rate. These are all really good, you know, control, uh, you know, weed control um, programs that we can have. It's going to give you some residual control. It's going to also bring a lot more um, different sites of action to the tank mix for us. Um, you know, so that's going to be helpful um, in, in managing um, you know, these resistant weeds. Uh, looking at some others, the Halix GT that's been around for a long time. That's the, the glyphosate Callisto Dual 2 Magnum. Um, and then you've got, uh, you know, glyphosate Resolve Q. And this is one that, you know, I have a question mark too, because I was, you know, looking at this slide thinking that, well, should I really, should we really think about Resolve Q and glyphosate? Not that Resolve Q is a bad pro um, product, but we look at um, Resolve Q. What is it? It's a premix of Resolve, Resolve Your Own plus Harmony. So Harmony and Resolve are a group two. We have glyphosate, it's a group nine. So I don't know, you know, from a stewardship standpoint, should we be looking at just glyphosate in a group two? I don't think we should. I think we need to add something more to that tank mix um, besides a group two and a group nine. Um, you know, I think that's um, that's where we have to really think about that. Um, looking at glyphosate Realm Q, that would be a better situation that, that we have. It's going to be better than the Resolve Q by itself because now we have the Realm Q, which is the Resolve, the Rim Soft Ron, plus it has the Mesotrion um, being the Callisto in that mix. So now in this one, we've got, you know, three different sites of action, um, you know, to improve our um, our different tank mixes that are in there. And then just glyphosate and Yukon, and I mentioned that earlier, how maybe that's better stewardship to have glyphosate and Yukon versus just glyphosate and Permit or Permit Plus, which is Health Sophiron Plus Harmony, um, or just Permit, which is the Health Sophiron, which 
permit and permit plus or group two and then the other two group twos mixed together so that would be going back to a group nine to group two versus the yukon which is a glyphosate and then a group two and a group nine um, liberty so i know that there's some interest in liberty um link corn um, hybrids i know we're seeing um, some liberty being used in uh, in soybean situations as well um, just a couple of things on liberty that i'll touch on and then i'll i'll be quiet um, contact herbicide it's not translocated so you know some people think that well liberty is going to be you know it's just instead of roundup we're going to use liberty um, so on the liberty link corn hybrid it's it's a contact herbicide it's not translocated um, so that's going to change the way we 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 need to to make the applications and when we make the applications and timing of the application so with liberty um, as opposed to, to using glyphosate um, we need to well, we still have to target the weeds in our early growth stage, but it's really critical for Liberty because, you know, even if we were behind on the, on the, the timing of application of um, glyphosate on, on a weed, um, you, there's a chance you're going to kill it. You know, you might have sacrificed some yield because you were a little later, but you're going to kill it. But if you're too late on the application timing of Liberty, you're not going to control that weed in all those um, situations. We need to include, uh, uh, we have to apply the full rates um, including ammonium sulfate at one and a half to three pounds per acre. We're going to want to use a minimum of 15 gallons per acre as our carrier. And if we get into a dense weed canopy or, or thick weeds, you're going to have to bump that up to 20 gallons per acre. So something that we don't have to look at, um, actually in Roundup, we can be down a lot lower rate. I um, mean, you, you can be really effective at even down as low as 10 gallons of acre um, carrier with Roundup as opposed to Liberty now contact. So it's going to be higher volume, we're going to need to use medium to coarse droplets. We need to get um, nice droplets on, on the leaves. We want to make sure the applications are done on warm, sunny days with high humidity, no dew. Roundup doesn't matter if there's dew on it in the morning. We can spray it and it doesn't wash off. Liberty, big difference. Don't do it. We also want to look at the application timing. You know, apply it two hours after sunrise to two hours prior to sunset. That's ideal time for it. I think on the label it says from sunrise to two hours prior to sunset, but I'm going to be on the on that air of caution and say let's let's go a little bit, little bit better. Let's get it you know so it's better mid morning to through the early afternoon hours for Liberty um, applications. Um, so if we want to put together a program on Liberty Link corn hybrids, we're going to be looking at Liberty. <clears throat> we're going to consider adding Diflex with it. Diflex Duo, Lotus or Caprino, those are nice things to add with Liberty. You can add atrazine to it. Um, also, if you wanted to go with a 50% of a labeled pre. Um, you know, go ahead and do that. You know, Harness Max and Resicor at a reduced rate actually work really nicely with Liberty Link corn hybrids. And that's what I have on it. I know it was long and we'll shorten it up on the